I appreciate that many people in this room will be disappointed, but we all, including we ministers in the British government, have to respect the uh, decision. I would like to stress that this outcome does not mean that Britain is turning its back, either economically or politically, uh, on Europe. The best uh, solution that we can see would be a comprehensive free trade uh, agreement, uh, in some ways similar to that seen between Canada uh, and the uh, EU, although I think in certain respects it would be uh, different. We would seek to have a financial services chapter in our FTA, and it would seek to ensure that the UK was not uh, considered just another third country, but could get as close to EEA access as possible. We sh would agree with the Canadian model, that is to say, a completely banal trade agreement with the UK, but nothing else. Brexit is something which does, as we all know, does not only affect you, but affects our electorate. And this um, proposal, which is not on, on the table, which I would call the cherry-picking proposal after, after torturing uh, uh, us uh, over months, is not accepted. So the love is not, is not gone, but there is a kind of, kind of awkward situation mm. that the one you love is leaving you. And that, is, <laughs> that comes with a lot of irrational, in normal life, with a lot of irrational... But others etc. love you too. And your citizens. It's not going to be as now, but just us being Canada, but better. No, not at all. This will not work like that, and, and it's not retaliation. It's time for some reciprocity, not doing just a cherry-picking um, approach. And it is in the vital interest of Poland that European Union remains cohesive, so that uh, and, uh, other countries which would like to emulate what Britain did would be deterred. And we are very much for the deterrence because we are very much for the cohesion <coughs> of European Union and we would never support any agreement which would be better than the one for Norway or Switzerland. As far as Ireland is concerned, I, I want to make it clear that this is an absolutely devastating decision that Britain has taken. Uh, we regard it as an unfriendly act. Yeah. And how can you expect <coughs> that after you're leaving, European economy would still be about the biggest in the world, that that economy would accept that its financial center is outside its borders. How can you, can you really ex expect somebody to accept that? You are obliging us, all the European Union, to spend money, energies, a big, big investment in trying to arrange and that will take years and years the consequences of divorce. Well, Europe would never agree to passporting, open passporting for British uh, financial institutions unless you would also agree, at least to a certain degree, on the supervisory powers of the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, because if not, that would break up the whole uh, monetary union. I mean, you cannot have a free rider. I'm not quite sure whether I can uh, um, impress my Frankfurt uh, electorate that if there's the one and only chance after your Brexit exit uh, to compete with London as the, uh, as the leading financial sector, yeah. would you ask me to make an arrangement with the UK government now, very soon, that gives, that, that gives you a free entry card to the European financial market, which would be seen as a competitive disadvantage from, uh, from the status quo we are aiming at. This, uh, this is not a, cannot be a serious option uh, in our negotiation. The potential of Amsterdam to become, together with Frankfurt, the financial capital of Europe race, and also the headquarters for all kind of international companies. I think it's emerged very clearly in the uh, debate. The most difficult point for the UK will be financial uh, services. Is it possible to have an agreement whereby we have uh, access for financial services but don't have to concede free movement of labor? Uh, you know, that, that's really the, the trade-off. But there are other 
things in this has emerged in our discussion, such as could Britain make a contribution that might be welcomed by the EU. We have very close military cooperation. This will be determined by customers. It will be determined by markets. One of the illusions that hangs over the whole European debate is that trade flows are dictated by politicians. The British people have left the European Union and thereby created a structure of instability on the island of Ireland. No country will suffer as much from this decision that you've taken as Ireland. And I have to address my colleagues here at the table to recognise this. We're going to suffer from this far more than any of you are around this table. We had the uh, Irish example that we think even more to help the Irish to get, to get through this stuff yeah. before we negotiate uh, a free entry card for, for London financial services to the European Union we won't. is a shift of focus. It has nothing to do with, the, with retaliation, but, but with the fact that they are in and you want to get out. The event of a Brexit defense is an area where we, the, the rest of well, the rest, the European, the new European Union would need to cooperate. I think the, maybe the, the easiest topic to solve will be the, the foreign security one. With regard to foreign policies, there is no problem because it's based mainly on cooperation. For instance, the 2K treaty is a treaty, so it's, it's not uh, integrated in the Union. So I don't see any issue with regard to fight against terrorism, for instance. really see the um, positive part of, of leaving uh, Europe or European Union. We've seen uh, uh, this morning and this afternoon we will find good solutions uh, on a better Europe together with Britain. We will find uh, a solution on, on, on Brex post-Brexit. But I would suggest that the most preferable, me personally, but probably for Europe, is that we we would have the strong British voice in the first row of the European debate. The UK has had a tremendous influence on French and uh, European civilization and also on competitiveness and liberalization inside Europe. My final conclusion is that uh, we are discussing as the European Union is the center of the world. That is not more the case. So, in case of Brexit, we risk to have years and years of discussions and wasting energy, time, money, when the rest of the world will run without us. This is the key point. <coughs> and we have to look at the big picture. Yeah. The rest of the world is not waiting for us. So the debate on what uh, would happen with Great Britain if they vote no, should be uh, conducted before the referendum. And it's, it's, it's obvious that nobody really knows how to do this, but it's very difficult to, to have a template <coughs> that uh, uh, demonstrates that uh, Great Britain would be better off. One thing I think that's been very valuable in Norman's contribution is that he has come out clearly in favour of a Canada-style arrangement rather than the EEA or the Swiss-style arrangement. I think it's very helpful because that helps us now to focus uh, on what Canada has got and how that might apply to Britain. This, of course, is an issue that won't be determined uh, by the politicians. It'll be determined by the people of this country. I believe that Europe does need some sort of supranational framework. I personally think that the framework we have is not right, it's too remote, it's incomprehensible, not one person in a thousand could define qualified majority voting for you. We need, I think, a different sort of arrangement, but I don't see that coming uh, about. Uh, I don't believe that getting out will be disastrous for uh, Britain. We had a number of people saying they uh, respected our decision, but the moment after they'd taken a breath and said they respected our decision, uh, there seemed to be a certain underhand, seething uh, 
not very well concealed uh, <laughs> dislike of the decision that had been made. 